Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amaris Williams, and I'm the executive director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations. On behalf of the League, I want to welcome you to today's webinar with the Norwich Historical Society. And before we begin, I just wanted to say um, a few words about some logistics here. Um, before we get started, take a moment to locate the chat feature in Zoom. If you can't see the Zoom controls, um, move your mouse around a little bit. Um, if your Zoom went full screen when Joyce shared her screen, you may need to escape out of that or um, look at the controls at the top of the page. You should be able to see the chat. Um, and if you haven't found it already, you can feel free to introduce yourself to the group. Um, in order to speak to everyone who's in the webinar, you need to select the drop down menu that says panelists and attendees. If you just want to send a message to the panelists, which is myself, Regan, and our guest, Joyce, um, then you can just select panelists and that will be a message that will go to us. We're going to use the chat feature primarily because um, I think it's the one that people are most familiar with for um, fielding your questions for the course of this webinar. So um, if, as uh, Joyce is doing her presentation, you have any questions, you can just pop them into the chat. Regan and I will both be monitoring that and we'll tee them up for our speaker uh, at the end. If you have a more complicated question that you'd like to ask live, you can raise your hand um, afterwards and um, we'll do our best to call on you and allow you to speak. Um, I see there are a few people who have their hands raised now. Um, just for, I, I'm assuming that most of those are, are just fiddling around with the Zoom controls thing. So I'm gonna lower all hands before we get started just so later on I can actually know who's raised their hands. I just wanna say a few quick words about the Connecticut League of History Organizations. Um, we are a nonprofit membership organization that exists to support and strengthen the people and organizations that do history in Connecticut. So these include town historical societies like Norwich's, museums, large and small, libraries and archives, ethnic and community organizations, and of course the staff, board members, volunteers, and history enthusiasts who make them tick. And we do this by providing resources, training, professional development, and networking opportunities for Connecticut's history community. And our collaboration with Norwich Today on this series grows out of our mission to support our members with the tools they need to do their work well, even during COVID. Norwich has a great idea and a lineup of speakers. We've got a Zoom account, presto, a virtual lecture series is born. We also work closely with Connecticut Humanities to advocate for the importance of history and cultural heritage at the state and national levels. Next month, for instance, we'll join organizations from across the country at Museums Advocacy Day, virtually of course, uh, to speak up for the important role that history and museums play in our communities. During COVID, all CLHO programming is virtual, so it's easy for you to get involved and see what we're about. Tomorrow at noon, we'll be hosting one of our free colleague circles on Zoom. Um, and I will be just kind of introducing some folks who are new to the history community in Connecticut and having kind of a virtual meetup. Um, so I can pop a link in the chat um, for anyone who might be interested in checking that out. And you can also see some of our uh, other virtual programs on our YouTube channel. With that, I'll hand things over to Regan Miner, Executive Director of the Norwich Historical Society, who will say a few words and introduce our speaker. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Amaris. Appreciate it very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Regan Miner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Norwich Historical Society. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We are so excited about today's program. Before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Norwich Historical Society. The Norwich Historical Society was formed in 2001, and our mission is to preserve, protect, and promote the rich history of Norwich, Connecticut. Over the past five years, the Norwich Historical Society launched several initiatives designed to strengthen Norwich's heritage tourism efforts, such as opening the Norwich Heritage and Regional Visitor Center and launching the Walk Norwich Trail System, which is a series of historically themed self-guided walking tours accessible via walknorwich.org. In addition, the Norwich Historical Society supports our mission through programming such as guided walking tours, educational programming for area students, lectures, historically themed events, and the restoration of numerous historic buildings. For more information about the Norwich Historical Society or to learn how to become a member, please visit our website at norwichhistoricalsociety.org. As Amaris mentioned, we were trying to find some programming for this winter series as well, because of course, during this era of COVID, we cannot gather the way we normally would. So the Norwich Historical Society is offering a free 
virtual winter lecture series based on topics from our Walk Norwich Trail system. The four part lecture series is open to the public and free. This webinar is offered in collaboration with the Connecticut League of History Organizations and we're so grateful to Amaris and CLHO for their support. The first lecture in our virtual winter lecture series will focus on topics from the Benedict Arnold Trail. Benedict Arnold was born and raised in Norwich, Connecticut, and is often remembered for his infamous betrayal of the Patriot cause during the American Revolution. But what led this brilliant military commander to shift his allegiance so drastically? Our featured speaker, Joyce Malcolm, attempts to answer this very question in her book, The Tragedy of Benedict Arnold in American Life. So now that you have all the background and information, I am going to um, introduce our speaker and read her bio briefly. So Joyce Lee Malcolm is a constitutional scholar focused on individual rights, war, and society. She's a Patrick Henry professor of constitutional law and the Second Amendment Emeritus at Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. She's a member of the National Council on the Humanities and the author of eight books and numerous articles. Her award-winning book, The Tragedy of Benedict Arnold and American Life, published by Peg Pegasus Press in 2018, was praised in the Washington Post as a fine biography, the best in recent memory. Her other book, Peter's War, A New England Slave Boy and the American Revolution, published by Yale University Press, tells the dramatic story of Peter born into slavery in Massachusetts and sold as a toddler to a childless white couple in 1765. Another one of her books, To Keep and Bear Arms, The Origins of an Anglo-American Right, published by Harvard University Press, was cited several times in the Supreme Court's landmark Second Amendment case, District of Columbia versus Heller. Her other book, Guns and Violence, The English Experience, was also published by Harvard Press. Joyce's essays have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the London Telegraph, the Boston Globe, the Philadelphia Inquirer, BBC News Online, and she's been the guest on numerous radio and TV programs. I'm so excited to have Joyce here this afternoon presenting on her book, The Tragedy of Benedict Arnold and American Life. My distinct pleasure to welcome Joyce Lee Malcolm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. And I realize that I will be speaking to people who know quite a lot about Benedict Arnold's childhood and life. So some of this may be a refresher for you particularly the uh, residents of Norwich um, who have uh, grown up or living in uh, the town in which uh, he was raised. Um, I, I'm just going to sort of start with a couple of comments about Arnold, one of his own, and then a description of him, and then um, say a little bit about uh, the way that people look at him now. Um, I just, Here's the man, or at least as good a picture as we have of him in his youth. Um, Arnold at what was his court martial for some financial improprieties in 1780 stated, um, he said, I've suffered in seeing the fair fabric of reputation, which I've been with so much danger and toil raising since the present war undermined by those whose posterity as well as themselves, will feel the blessed effects of my efforts. I think with his victory at Saratoga, that was definitely true. Uh, underneath is a description of him uh, by one of the soldiers who was under his command and uh, knew him at Saratoga. He said he was dark skinned with black hair and middling height. There wasn't any waste timber in him. He was our fighting general and a bloody fellow he was. He didn't care for nothing, he'd ride right in. It was come on boys, it wasn't go boys. He was a brave, as brave a man as ever lived. Uh, and yet of course, Arnold is still for the most part seen in a, as a kind of two dimensional character. There have been biographies that have tried to uh, teach the public that there were other aspects to him and that he was a hero before uh, this um, tragedy uh, and, and treason, um, but he still, comes across for most people as someone uh, who was self-seeking and, and a villain, reckless, greedy. Um, and now his wife, Peggy, his beautiful young wife from Philadelphia, the Belle of Philadelphia, has been depicted as an Eve who tempted her husband 
into treason. And there are something like seven books just about Peggy. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to really go into uh, Peggy's life much, um, but I, I assure you that in my estimation and from my research that she was innocent, but it makes a great story that she was just another Eve. So if he was okay, he was tempted by her. But when you look at the whole of the man's life and experience, this judgment of him as greedy and self-serving uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, first of all, um, he risked his life on numerous battlefields, which you don't do if you're just in there to see what you can get from a, an occasion. Um, he paid his men uh, when Congress failed to pay them. Um, he, as I say, risked death on numerous battlefields. He was actually the best commander on either side in the revolution. Um, some say the well, he was very prickly and you know, got angry when he was passed over for promotion. Um, but most of the people who were passed over actually quit and went home um, and he didn't. Uh, also, he was grievously injured, of course, in the course of, um, of his um, work and uh, battlefield career and became a cripple in the cause of American independence. Um, I'd just like to read you quickly a comment by J.W. Fortescue, who is the writer, the author of the classic work on the British Army. And this is what he said about Arnold and the revolution. He said, a natural military genius, neither Washington nor Green are to my mind comparable with Benedict Arnold. He possessed all the gifts of a great commander. To boundless energy and enterprise, he united quick insight into a situation, sound strategic instinct, audacity of movement, wealth of resource, a swift and unerring eye in action, great personal bearing, and true magic of leadership. It was he and no other who beat Burgoyne at Saratoga. And with Daniel Morgan, who had a, a group of sharpshooters from Virginia to command his militia, Benedict Arnold was the most formidable opponent that could be matched against the British in America. What I'd like to do is to sort of try to give you a sort of more accurate picture of Arnold and a bit about Peggy. Um, and a little bit about the animosities among the patriots, which were really news to me when I started to do this research. But just quickly, um, I'd like to say something about his childhood in Norwich. Um, again, that's probably familiar to you Norwichians, <laughs> but, um, but it's sort of the key to the rest of his life. Um, Arnold's father was a merchant seaman and quite well off. Uh, he captained his own ship and sailed from Canada uh, along the coast uh, south to the Caribbean and across to England. Um, the family lived very well. He built a fine house. And when Arnold was a boy, um, he went in the summers with his father sailing. So he really became quite an expert um, on seafaring. Um, the family had hoped, and he was their only son, to send him to university. And when he was, um, a little bit older, uh, about 10 or 12, he went to a boarding school that was to prepare young boys to go on to Yale College. Um, what happened, however, was that while he was away, there was a diphtheria disease which killed two of, two of his little sisters. Um, and whether that was the problem that upset his father or his father always had a problem, his father became an alcoholic. And as he became more and more of an alcoholic, his business went to rack and ruin. Arnold's mother tried to keep it going, um, but without the father to carry on these trips, um, the, the family eventually went bankrupt. And in a small town like Norwich, this was extraordinarily embarrassing, uh, really humiliating. And Arnold was pulled out of boarding school, never got the chance to go to college and was instead apprenticed to some relatives of his mother's. So he seemed to be determined the rest of his life to make amends for the humiliation, to build up the family's honor, to and ended up repaying uh, all the loans that they got to be able to keep their house and to pay back what was owed. But I think that was an important aspect of the whole of his life that he was constantly hoping to 
make up for that, as he said in that first, uh, the first quotation that I read you that, you know, he was trying to, um, let's see if I get it right here, to see the fair fabric of reputation, which I have been with so much danger and toil raising since the present war. So I think this is really important. Okay, uh, now for a couple of um, highlights of his career, one that you may not be as familiar with, and that is that in October of 1776, there was a great battle on Lake Champlain. The British uh, tried in 1776 and again in 1777 to cut New York State off from New England. And in 1776, they had amassed some 13,000 soldiers and sailors in Canada, both British, Irish, and German troops, and were planning to sail down Lake Champlain um, down to Albany as a way of taking over uh, the, uh, that area and separating New York. Um, there was nothing to really stop them. George Washington and most of his army uh, were in New York State trying to uh, hold New York City against the British. Um, lake Champlain is a beautiful lake. It's about four miles wide at its widest point and 400 feet deep in spots, but it has a lot of shallow inlets. So here it was, uh, and the New York Committee of Safety was desperate to have something to stop this fleet coming down. So they asked Arnold to take charge of building a fleet. Now I'm from upstate New York and I can tell you that building a fleet in upstate in that area is not easy. Um, Arnold had only two to three months uh, to do it. He began in July to build a fleet of 15 ships to guard these corridors of lakes from Canada to Albany. And he drafted artisans. He personally picked out some 20,000 boards of timber. Um, now I wanna show you the ships that he built. Um, oop, this is, This is his flagship, the Royal Savage. And the Royal Savage was actually, this is the best ship he had. It's actually a British ship that he had stolen from the British after Ticonderoga was taken. They had sailed up to Canada and, and managed to take this ship. Um, so this was the flagship for his little fleet. He started with that one ship and it had um, a fair amount of guns. It was really a warship, but a small one. This is called a gondola. And they're not to be confused with gondolas. <laughs> um, but these very flat bottom ships could go into shallow waters and were very popular uh, around New England and in that area. Um, these um, gondolas were, had two square sails and they carried a crew of about 45 and they had three cannon. He also built two galleys which were 80 feet uh, long by 20 with two masts and carried a crew of 10 to 12, uh, excuse me, guns of 10 to 12 guns and a crew of up to a hundred men. So the, the gondolas were the smaller ones, then there were a couple of big galleys. And then there was this schooner that he had, the 200 ton Royal Savage. The British were also constructing a fleet up in Canada and they actually sailed across the ocean, kind of prefabricated sections of ships that would be assembled when they got to Canada. And they constructed their fleet in less than three months from these sections. But their crew was staffed by Royal Navy officers and really seasoned sailors. Um, and their major ship was the Thunderer. And I'm just gonna go back to you, let you see Benedict Arnold's major ship his flagship, the Savage. Now I'll take another look at the Thunderer. This was an enormous ship. Um, it, um, it was one of some 20 gunships and five large vessels that the British had in this fleet. The Thunderer had weighed 423 tons and was the largest ship ever seen on Lake Champlain. The power of these fleets was measured in their gunpower by the cannons. And the American fleet under Arnold had 703 pounds of cannon weight. Compare this to the British fleet, which had 1,300 pounds. So it was more, almost twice as much. Arnold tried to find a place where this smaller fleet um, would be able to protect itself. 
and he had scoured Lake Champlain looking for the right spot. Um, he found it in Valcor Island, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but in August, August 24th, now remember he was starting in July, so he didn't have much time. August 24th, he led his little fleet of ships north. On September 23rd, they took up their position, these little 16 vessels and 500 men in the shadow of the Valcor Island to await the British. The ships were painted red. Uh, it was now being coming fall and they wanted them to blend with the autumn leaves and they were camouflaged with boughs of spruce trees to prevent boarding uh, um, and discourage these enemy sailors from coming on board. Um, the two fleets were to meet on October 11th. He had his fleet and I, I can't really, well, maybe I can show you. The American fleet is here in, the, in this channel of Valcar Island hiding. And the British fleet is in these, this little hatch route coming down from the north. The British fleet did not even have Valcar Island on their map. So they did not know that the, that the American fleet was there. Um, and um, at eight o'clock, the, uh, the Americans spotted the, the British fleet. British were some five miles south of Valcar Island before they spotted the Americans. Um, Arnold took his ship, the Royal Savage, and you can see it down here, out to kind of attack the British fleet and then try and get back to his line. But on the way back to the line, the Royal Savage got caught on a reef and was kind of torn to shreds uh, by the British ships. Um, there was a battle that went on for six hours. Um, and at the end of it, um, the noise had been, I should say the noise had been heard for 30 miles to the south and it raged for six hours. The end, there were about 80 men killed of Arnold's a small force and the ships had used up about three quarters of the ammunition. So they were in really bad shape as evening fell. Now I'm gonna just read you a little bit about what Arnold did. Um, it's, it's nighttime now. General Waterbury and Colonel Wigglesworth rode through the black waters that night to meet, meet Arnold. Arnold had left his ship, the Royal Savage and boarded the Congress, which was in the middle of his, his line. These commanders were despondent, but Arnold had prepared for this moment and he had a plan, a desperate but doable plan. The, the fleet would escape that evening by slipping between the British ships, blocking the Valker Channel, then dash south to Crown Point in safety. It was an exceedingly risky strategy. Many of their vessels were badly damaged and some were leaking. The little fleet with its 500 sailors had lost some 80 men killed or wounded including many officers with 20 others captured. If any of the British crews spotted them, they would be vulnerable and readily destroyed. But what other option did they have? It was a moonless night. They set out at seven o'clock. A heavy autumn mist rising from the lake shrouded the American ships as they began moving in single file. Their oars were muffled uh, in shirts that were tied around them. The wounded had been kept below deck so their moans would not alert the enemy. Each ship was completely dark, except for a small lantern in the stern and a shrouded one in the bow. A chalk mark, mark on the rear rails lit by a slit in the rear lantern made the, stern's ve the vessel's stern just visible to the ship immediately behind. Wigglesworth and the galley trumble led. One by one, the gondolas and smaller vessels followed in silence. The Congress with Arnold aboard and the Washington were last in line. The procession passed so close to the Carlton, that was one of the major British ships, that they could hear its sailors chatting as they glided past it. They were in luck. The British had moved their three large men of war a mile from the western shore of the lake, inadvertently leaving a passageway for the American ships to slip through. The British commander woke with a shock the next morning to find that the American fleet was gone. Writing General Burgoyne Carlton, who was the head of this fleet, admitted he had gone to sleep expecting in the morning to be able to engage them with our whole fleet. But to our great mortification, he confessed, we perceived at daybreak that they had found a means to escape us unobserved by any of our guard boats or cruisers. 
the British had assumed that the American fleet had gone north through the sound, but they didn't realize that the that sound was too shallow for the Americans to do that, which is why that Arnold had to go south. After going north, the British fleet then turned around and, and started after the American fleet going south. Arnold and his ships had gone to a nearby island and to repair some of the vessels. Uh, the Jersey was so waterlogged it had to be, couldn't even be towed or even burned, but was allowed to sink. Um, about two o'clock after mending the sails on the, on the Washington, they weighed anchor with a fresh breeze and went southward. In the course of the day, the British fleet uh, caught up with the American fleet. And in the, and in the morning, um, Arnold uh, decided that what they had to do was to have his ship, the Congress, and this, this other ship, the Washington, turn and face the enemy while the rest of the little fleet got away. They, they did so and, um, let me just see, sorry. <laughs> the two ships fought fiercely while the rest of the fleet got away. Both ships took a terrible beating, as you can imagine. The Washington was surrounded and badly damaged, Arnold. Arnold explained the Washington galley was in such a shattered condition and had so many men killed and wounded she struck her flag to the enemy after receiving a few broadsides. And Waterbury, the commander, decided to surrender to save his crew of some 100 men. That left Arnold's, Arnold in the Congress to fight on alone. The British ships, in Arnold's words, kept up an incessant fire on us for about five glasses. That's an hourglass. That's five, in this case, about four hours, with round and grape shot, which we returned as briskly. The Congress, surrounded by seven enemy ships, began receiving broadside after broadside. Through the smoke, her flag, don't tread on me, could still be glimpsed flying. The sails rigging and hull of the Congress were shattered and torn in pieces, Arnold reported. The first lieutenant and three men killed. He was out of ammunition. 27 of his 70 man crew were dead or wounded. Still, he would not surrender. Somehow he managed to break through the encircling ships with his little gondolas, he made for one of, got into one of the gondolas and made for a creek on the Vermont shore where the British vessels could not follow. Having run his ships aground, Arnold ordered the crews to take their firearms and leap overboard. Holding their guns aloft, they waded to shore. That done, he set fire to the Congress and the gondolas while his men fired their weapons to keep smaller British vessels at bay. Arnold stayed watching the fire until he was sure it had spread to all the vessels. The Congress's flag was still flying as the flames consumed it. Leaping from his ship's bow, Arnold led his 150 exhausted men through the forest. They took a special route to avoid the Indians and got to Crown Point, but there was no safety there. So they had to uh, push on um, another 25 miles to Ticonderoga, carrying their wounded uh, in um, slings that were made from sails. It was an amazing, feet to have done that. I mean, the British had won the day, uh, but it was now late. Um, what happened was that um, their commander, Carlton, was left with a choice. He could not any longer take Albany, so he would have had to just keep his fleet in Lake Champlain for the winter, and the ships might have gotten caught in the ice. And so he decided that the best thing to do was to go back to Canada. And basically, Arnold's small fleet had saved Albany and New York for that year. Gates writing to Schuyler about the victory said it has pleased Providence to preserve General Arnold. Few men ever met with so many hairbreadth escapes in so short a space of time. And then his orders on the 14th, the general order said to General Arnold and officers, seamen and Marines of the fleet for the gallant defense they made against the great superiority of the enemy's force. And Fortescue, the author of that collection, um, the classic work on the British Army, had bemoaned, very different would it have been if the British had been commanded by such a man as Arnold, who amazing skill, gallantry, and resource made him undoubtedly the hero of this short campaign. He was sorry that the British had actually gone back to Canada and not continued on. Um, while he was uh, so our, after this battle, Arnold just went home uh, to New Haven. He had moved to New Haven from Norwich to begin a career 
uh, as a merchant seaman himself and set up a shop and home there. And he was welcomed as a great hero on the way back. He at Hartford and Middleton and uh, Middletown and New Haven. But during that winter, Congress was tightening its control over the army. It didn't trust Washington and the, and the army um, to yield to civilian control. They were always afraid that an army would take over uh, and throw out the Congress as it happened uh, during the English Civil War. So they took over all of the promotions and they promoted five junior officers over Arnold. Um, Arnold heard about it and um, was ready to resign. Uh, but Washington asked him not to and Arnold agreed to stay on as long as he could be of use. So he went back to his home in New, in New Haven. And while he was there, um, he got a, a message uh, that the British had in fact invaded Connecticut and were making for Danbury where the uh, Americans had a large arsenal. So right away he left home, got together with uh, some militia that he could and set off um, making for the, uh, that area. They, um, the object was Danbury, so he went, uh, which was lightly defended and he got together with Generals Worcester and Silman, who were leading 600 militia, and they had marched off hoping to protect the supplies. But by, they got, by the time they got to Danbury, it was up in flames. Um, the American leaders tried then to kind of head off the British um, and pursue them. They weren't sure which way they went. And um, one of the, the uh, American uh, officers, Worcester, took 200 men uh, trying to get behind the enemy. Um, he did catch up with the British, but in the fighting, he, this general received a fatal wound. Um, Arnold began a forced march to Ridge, Ridgefield, which was on the way back. And when he got there, he organized the uh, people of Ridgefield and the militia to begin a defense against the British. He got them to stack up wagons and furniture and logs and other things to make a a barrier uh, that they could fight behind. Their troops were very greatly outnumbered by the 2,000 British soldiers. But Arnold was determined to cut off the British retreat to their ships. He ordered his men to, as I say, to throw up this barrier. Behind this makeshift barrier, they were held off three charges. They were finally forced to retreat when a British force flanked them. During one of the charges, Arnold's horse was shot I have to tell you that I would not have wanted to be one of Arnold's horses because they were frequently shot under him. He, they would, he would always dash right into the middle of the fighting. At any rate, the horse was shot and he trapped him under it. A young local Tory dashed up to him, bayonet fixed, shouting, surrender, you are my prisoner. With a mighty effort, Arnold freed himself from this horse and replied, not yet. And drawing his pistol, he shot the man in the chest. He then leaped over a fence, ran through a swamp, bullets spraying all around him. And the following day, he sent a message saying that he was preparing to waylay the regulars uh, from the front. And they tried to attack the British before they got back to their boats, but they were too late. In recognition of Arnold's taking this kind of action, rallying the militia to drive them out of Connecticut, on May 2nd, the members of Congress voted to promote him to Major General. So those five, Junior officers had been made major general. Arnold was also made a major general, although they were, they were still senior to him. I think that gives you a little sense of, of uh, Arnold and on the move. He could fight on land or on sea. He was an excellent commander. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do now is take a look at Arnold at Saratoga. Um, this is a, a map of Saratoga. Um, when Arnold got to, Arnold had been sent by um, Washington up to uh, the Saratoga area. The British in 1777 were trying the same thing they had done in 1776, but they had a, a large 
uh, military force as well as some ships, but mostly they were relying on General Burgoyne and his large army. And uh, Washington felt sure that Arnold would be able to rally the militia and sent him up to help. But Gates at this point, who had been so fond of him when he, uh, the year before, was sort of jealous of Arnold and um, actually uh, told him that he uh, didn't want him there anymore. Uh, Arnold was a, a patronized by Washington that Gate, who Gates had wanted to replace. Um, and so he told Arnold that, that he, um, he was no longer needed and, Ar and gave him, stripped him of command and confined him to his tent. Um, this was a terrible for Arnold who um, hated to be confined to his tent when there was a battle going on. And actually it was Gates who in that, that day uh, would not go from uh, into um, the battle. In fact, didn't even, wasn't even where he could see it. But it, and it was only the, the petition of the officers and men that kept Arnold there. Otherwise he would certainly have left. It was a, very humiliating not to have any command. Confined to his tent by Gates, left without a command while the very ground was shaking from the deafening pounding of the great guns. The air filled with acrid smoke and cries of battle, Arnold could tolerate no more. And mounting his powerful dark horse, he dashed toward the battlefield shouting to his aides, no man shall keep me in my tent today. If I'm without command, I will fight in the ranks. But for the soldiers, God bless them. They will follow my lead. Come on, victory or death. And then he got, he, galloped straight into the thickest of the fighting pursued by General uh, Major John Armstrong, who Gates had ordered to bring him back. But Arnold was faster, catching up with the rear of Lernan's brigade. He asked the man who their officer was. A soldier shouted, Colonel Latimer, sir. Arnold was delighted. My old Norwich and New London friends. God bless you, I'm glad to see you. Now come on boys, if the day is long enough, we'll have them all in hell before night. And a cheer went up and he put himself at their head, galloping back and forth on his splendid horse, brandishing his sword over his head. It, it's incredible that a man with absolutely no command could go into that battle uh, in the middle of it and the men followed him. And it says a great deal about Arnold as a soldier. Um, he led them uh, into the thick of it. And you can see on this map, pours going there are all of these three different uh, uh, regiments going up. And then here's Arnold leading one. And he led them toward this redoubt, sort of a big barrier that the, that the British had. And, um, and the, the, uh, re, the redoubt had near it what is called a sally point where the British opened up the line in case they needed to retreat. And Arnold spotted it and he led his men right for it. Um, and it, um, the terrified Germans who were guarding it uh, fled, firing a final volley as they went. One bullet hit Arnold's great dark horse, killing him. The animal fell like this other one had, uh, pinning Arnold. And now a musket ball hit Arnold, shattering his leg bone just above the knee, the same leg he'd injured in an assault a year earlier in Quebec. John Redmond, an American private who saw Arnold fall, rushed to bayonet the German soldier who'd shot him. But Arnold shouted to Redmond from the ground where he lay helpless in excruciating pain. Don't hurt him, he did but his duty, he's a fine fellow. And as he fell, Arnold shouted to his men, rush on my brave boys. And rush on they did, streaming over the British redoubt and winning the battle for the Americans. The end of the day, um, Arnold was carried from the field, bleeding and helpless. He waved away the officers. Let me show you this picture of him falling here. This is a print from that time. He, here's Arnold in the middle. He waved away the officers who hurried to help him. When Captain Dearborn asked where he was hit, he replied, in the same leg, I wish it had been my heart. Armstrong caught up with Arnold, intent on taking him back to headquarters, but that didn't happen. The men of Asa Bray's Connecticut Militia Company, caring for one of their own, gently placed Arnold on a litter and carried him to the field hospital. Gates never set foot 
on the, the field during the battle that day, nor did Lincoln. And in fact, one of Gates' aides, General Gates, who came to, to see um, and tell the general how the battle was going, found that instead of trying to keep up with the battle, General Gates was busy debating with a wounded British officer on the merits of the revolution. I had no idea what was happening, but it's Gates who got um, all of the credit for this great victory at Saratoga. After Saratoga, Arnold, who was wounded, was sent to Philadelphia after the um, French had allied with the British, with, excuse me, with the Americans, the British evacuated Philadelphia, which they had captured. And Arnold was put in charge to see that there was some sort of a peaceful return of those people who had, Americans who had fled. Um, and uh, there it's where he got to trouble. I mean, he couldn't take the field obviously because he was crippled, um, but the uh, executive council of Philadelphia felt that he was living too high and they disliked him and they brought these charges against him for violating some uh, of the rules um, about uh, which ships were to be allowed in, uh, whether you could use their wagons or not for personal purposes. They also drew up a list of some 300, more than 300 uh, Americans who they suspected of being loyalists and who they wanted Arnold to arrest and charge with treason. And he didn't do that, so they were very angry and they drew up these charges against him, eight charges which they printed in the Pennsylvania packet and sent copies to every other state, uh, claiming that Arnold was oppressive to the faithful subjects of this state, Pennsylvania, unworthy of his rank and station, highly discouraging to those who manifested their attachment to the liberties and interests of America and disrespectful to the Supreme Executive Authority. And they insisted that unless he was court-martialed, um, that they were gonna stop helping the army. They even threatened to secede. Um, of course, he was court-martialed. Um, and although the court-martial was postponed over and over, leaving Arnold for months with the, all of these allegations against him, um, that he was found guilty of two um, of the charges, one that he had used wagons that uh, were sitting around that Pennsylvania uh, had gotten to use for emergencies, uh, although he paid for them. But at any rate, um, he, uh, the result was that they charged him with that. Um, Washington wrote a letter, of uh, a polite letter of censorship to Arnold, but hoped that he would stay in the military. Um, which he did, um, but it, it, from this time on, Arnold was really increasingly bitter. He was also bitter because the Congress was constantly after him for the use of finances. We haven't talked about it, but after Ticonderoga, there was an attack on Canada and Arnold was given uh, a small group who were actually sent through the wilderness of Maine in this harrowing, harrowing journey um, to meet with another army under Montgomery and attack Quebec. And they had, Congress had given them a sum to finance that campaign. And Arnold had nobody to keep track of it. It was, they were fighting their way, starving in the wilderness. Um, at any rate, they continued to believe and argue that he owed them a thousand pounds, which he did not have. Um, they seldom paid their own people. Um, but at any rate, um, they were still complaining that he owed them this money at the same time that all these charges were being brought against him. Um, and, uh, and then it, it's at that point that he begins to think about uh, switching sides and um, going over to the British. Um, there was no way really for some of some people who were bitter about the way they've been treated simply retreated to their homes and had nothing more to do with the Continental Army. Many people preferred to be in politics than on the battlefield. Some just uh, were neutral and watched. Some made money on the war. Um, Arnold could not pay the money he was owed and was really uh, disenchanted. Um, I don't have time to talk about Peggy because I want to give you some time to be able to ask questions, but I'm happy to answer any. It is in Philadelphia that he meets 
the lovely Peggy, who was the Belle of Philadelphia, and who Washington and Lafayette and others felt was the most beautiful woman they'd ever seen. This picture today would not make you think she's the most beautiful woman, but uh, apparently, uh, you know, at that time, uh, it was thought to be, and I think, you know, maybe we have, maybe it doesn't capture her true beauty, but at any rate, she was really lovely. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it. She did not want to um, follow Arnold when he was caught in treason um, into exile. Uh, he had escaped to New York um, from West Point where he was the commander once the, uh, his plot, the plot was found out. And this is John Andreato who was carrying the message to the British about West Point. Um, at any rate, um, as far as I'm concerned, Peggy is an innocent and I'd be happy to discuss that uh, further if we have some time. Um, at the end of the day, um, Arnold uh, goes into exile. Uh, before that, he is in the British army and leads two campaigns, one against uh, the state of his uh, mentor, George Washington. I have a feeling these were purposely chosen to test how uh, steadfast he was to the British cause. The second was in his home state of Connecticut. Um, and then he went into exile with the British. Um, at the end of the war, um, that's where he was and that's where he died. Um, after the American Revolution, or excuse me, American Civil War, uh, this stone boot was erected at the battlefield of Saratoga in honor of the leg that he had sh and shattered on the site. It was hit above the knee, so it really uh, was a terrible, terrible injury. And he would not allow it to be amputated because it would have made him a cripple for life. Um, and also probably I think he wouldn't have minded dying of gangrene rather. He really wanted to die a soldier's death. And had he, had he been hit in the heart at Saratoga, he would have been one of our great heroes instead of someone whose name is a, a synonym for treason. But in 1887, this was uh, erected by one of the Union officers uh, during the American um, civil, civil War. On the back, it has no name on, on it, but on the back it says, in memory of the most brilliant soldier of the Continental Army, who was desperately wounded on this spot, the Sally Point of Brook Goins' great Western Redoubt, that's his barrier, October 1777, winning for his countrymen the decisive battle of the American Revolution and for himself the rank of Major General. And then on the anniversary of our uh, independence and the bicentennial, um, both Norwich and uh, some contributors in Britain erected a stained glass window at St. Mary's Church in London where Arnold and his wife Peggy are buried. And uh, you can see that on the one side we have American flags and on the other side British flags. Um, they, the, um, the caption on this is really charming and I think must have been carefully thought out. Um, it says, the two nations whom he served in turn in the years of their enmity have united in this memorial as a token of their enduring friendship. Why the demonization of Arnold, I'll just quickly read a, oops, a comment by, a comment by um, a historian who wrote about it. The demonization of Arnold served a rhetorical purpose in a new United States struggling to establish its identity, and perhaps in a post-Civil War United States struggling to recover its unity. But the price is unwarrantable and unjustly to forget or exculpate the circumstances and individuals that drove him to betray his country and so reduce a tragic figure to a mere caricature. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm afraid I've gone on a bit long, so I hope that uh, we do get a chance to um, hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. I know I greatly enjoyed the presentation and I'm hopeful everyone else did. <laughs> so thank you very, very much. <laughs>
Um, I did see a comment um, from one of my friends in Norwich, and she had a, a funny point that she wanted me to communicate. Um, in regards to Arnold's leg, um, one of the things that we do here in Norwich um, in partnership with um, Flock Theater out of New London, Connecticut, is we have a ceremony honoring um, Arnold's good leg. Um, oh, <laughs> so, so typically what we do oh, in, in you. <laughs> what we typically do in September is um, Flock Theater um, burns an effigy of Benedict Arnold in New London, but they remove the the good leg, and they transport it up to Norwich a few weeks later for an event at the Leffingwell House Museum, where the leg is presented with full military honors and. Um, <laughs> And it's a really fun event. We have reenactors present. Um, it's a great time at the Leffingwell House Museum in September. So uh, thank you, Faye, for mentioning that. And I wanted to let Joyce know about that great event that we do. Oh, that's, a, that's really charming. <laughs> what a wonderful thing to do. I mean, it took, he was in the hospital for something like three months because there were bits of bone they never could get out. And then he had to learn to walk all over again. So he, he really suffered uh, seriously from that injury. But that's nice to to uh, honor his, his good leg. <laughs> so I, I see have, a question. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Joy. Go ahead, Amherst, if you'd like to. <laughs> I was just going to say we have a, another question um, from Ron. Uh, did Washington try to repatriate Arnold following the war? No. Our, Washington was desperate to get Arnold back in order to try him for treason. And um, and John Andre, who was the go-between, the head of the British intelligence, who was taking messages from Arnold back to the British warship, was caught on the way. I had that little picture of him. Um, and then Andre was actually tried uh, as a spy because he was not wearing his uniform. He was wearing civilian clothes um, and given a proper trial and, and hanged as a spy. It was very upsetting because um, in fact, people thought Andre was so wonderful, he was so charming and honorable, that they wept <laughs> as he went to the scaffold. But, um, but Arnold, if, if there's some uh, hint that Arnold would have actually exchanged himself for Andre if uh, that had been possible, but Clinton would not allow it. So I think that Washington would definitely not have wanted to do that. He would have, he would have hanged him or shot him or whatever, but uh, he, he would have really wanted, he wanted desperately to get a hold of Arnold. And there was a, when Ar Arnold was leading these troops in Connecticut and Virginia, there was a, a bounty on his head, but they were never able to capture him. I may say that uh, Dane has um, their hand raised. Um, Dane, do you have a question? Um, would you like me to unmute you or do you have something? Let me, let me unmute you in case you'd like to share a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Great, thank you. Thank you, Amaris. And th thank you, everybody. Um, hello, Joyce. Um, I'm, Hi. My name's Dane. Um, Full disclosure, I'm Regan's husband. <laughs> and and I, <laughs> I, an insider here. <laughs> so I, I was very excited um, that you had agreed to do this because when uh, when your book came up, it, it surprised me because I, I was not aware that it was coming out and it was recommended to me by um, by a, a, a colleague of mine, and I, I couldn't put it down. It I, I've not read every I've not read every book on Arnold. I've read a bunch. Um, but yours by far is what I consider to be among the best, if not the best I've read on the subject. Um, oh, so if, um, if just real briefly, would you be able to tell us how you got interested in the topic and why you decided to write a book about him? And, um, and to follow up on that, um, I think that the, the be one of the best parts about your book is how you talk about his time in Philadelphia. Because to me, that was the real breaking point for him was um, how he spent his time in Philadelphia and the enemies that he earned there on the executive council, Joseph Freed and others um, that really sought to, um, to prosecute him in more ways than one. So um, if you could touch upon that a little bit, I'd, lo I'd love to hear a little more. Well, thank you. I didn't really have time to go into that, although I had, I had hoped to. Um, first, just how I got interested. I had written an earlier book, Peter's War, about this slave boy who from Massachusetts who fought during the American Revolution. And I followed the uh, 
the regiments Peter was in and what was going on in the military. And I was just really impressed by all the things that Arnold did, some of which I have obviously not been able to talk about here. So I really thought it would be very interesting to find out um, why he changed sides, what he had done, because people know so little about his heroism. You know, it seems to have been buried. And, and even the historians who write about uh, that period tend to see him through the lens of this treason. So, uh, and now there's all this material about him and letters. And so it was really an interesting topic. Um, he's done so much that it was a very difficult book to write because there was a lot to cover. Um, the, I'm glad you asked about Philadelphia because I had not been that aware of how split the Patriot side was between the radicals who like the executive council in Philadelphia wanted to um, arrest large numbers of people who they suspected of being loyalists and charge them with treason. Um, and, uh, and more moderates like many of the um, founders and leaders that we know like, like Wilson. And they really ended up in fact in a, um, in a battle, pitch battle where Wilson and the moderates were holed up in his house and the, uh, the militia egged on by the executive council. They didn't have a, a governor at that time. They had a council of about seven people um, attack this house and it was a shootout and seven or so people got killed and some wounded. Um, and Arnold heard the shooting and came rushing, um, but um, he was too late. All these people were arrested uh, who were involved. Um, and Arnold was attacked in the street uh, by people. And uh, he asked Congress for some kind of a guard. I mean, he was, he, he was a cripple. He's, <laughs> um, he had fought you know, so bravely on, uh, in these battles and, um, and leading his men. And Congress refused. Congress said, well, if you need a guard, you know, uh, the, the uh, government of Pennsylvania will supply it. And of course, they were not about to. They, they felt he lived too large. He had to, you know, he had, his headquarters were in a really big house that had belonged to the Pens. Everything he did annoyed them. And, um, and so, it, you know, he just, he was a person who, he was prickly. He, he was not a diplomat like Washington. He didn't hang around Congress and try and make friends. Um, he didn't um, tolerate fools gladly, but uh, he did resign from the position of being you know, in charge in Philadelphia, it didn't matter. They really, really wanted to get him. Um, and you know, their threats to Washington and the Continental Army and to Congress were ridiculous, but makes you remember that that the Congress was in Philadelphia. So they had a particular hold on what happened in the Congress. Um, so this was all very new information to me. I was quite shocked. Great, thank you, Joyce. Um, we have a couple questions, which I think we'll probably, given the time, are probably gonna be our last two questions. Um, okay. For the first is a question from Sandra. Um, she writes, Joyce, you had mentioned that Arnold, as a British general, was sent to attack Virginia and Connecticut, possibly to test his loyalty. Are there writings, letters, or orders, for example, that support this? Thank you. So she's kind of interested in the uh, in the source base for that. Yeah, I'm interested in it too, and I I haven't found anything that actually says that. But to first of all, to pick out Virginia, which had been really not involved much in what in the fighting, um, with uh, but was. Washington's home state and where he ended up you know, leading this tr uh, group of men who um, took over Richmond and, and left um, Jefferson racing from his home at the last minute. Um, you know, I, I, can't th I couldn't think why those two places, you know, they really were very cautious about using him. They did give him a lot of soldiers. Um, but it, it's, it's an interesting question. And I, I just uh, judged that that seemed like that would be a real test. And then sending him to Connecticut, his home state, where people had, you know, hailed him and, you know, family, his family lived. Um, so all of that must have been extremely difficult. Uh, so it was just my, my judgment that that seemed quite suspicious that those two places were chosen. But good question. 
Great, thank you. Um, our last question is from Randy. He writes, I've heard that during her escape, Peggy Shipman was in Middletown with the children and an angry crowd gathered threatening to burn the house down. Is this true? And what became of Arnold's children in later life? Are there known descendants? Yes, um, actually descendants, I, almost every time I've given a talk, there's someone who's come up afterwards to say they were a descendant of the Arnolds and they were glad to hear something good about the man. Um, the thing is that uh, Arnold uh, was at West Point and Peggy was up there with their six month old baby when he um, was found out with this about this plot and he fled and uh, and he just you know tells her he's leaving and he's gone. Um, why she has given the choice of either following him into exile, which would mean going to New York and so forth, or going back home to her family in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia was very dangerous because they were busy trying to arrest all these people and try them with treason. But she wanted to be home with her family, which is one of the reasons I, I think she absolutely was innocent. <laughs> um, and so she was trapped and she had promised and her family promised she wouldn't keep in touch with Arnold or let them see any correspondence. But the, uh, she just wanted to stay there. But the executive council decided that it was too dangerous. And so they gave her two weeks to leave and her father uh, accompanied her up toward New York. It was his favorite child and said goodbye to her. Um, she had not wanted to go into exile. Um, he had three sons uh, from his first marriage. His wife died in 1776. Um, and they ended up uh, with, under the care of his sister, Hannah, and then going up to Canada uh, where from exile, uh, Arnold tried to find um, livelihoods for them and build up a shipping business, which didn't work too well. Um, he and Peggy had about five sons, and I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but they, they have one daughter and a batch of sons. And all Arnold's sons went into the military, the British Army. And one of the things I thought particularly interesting was I think one of his sons, who I believe was injured in India, was injured in the leg like his father had been. And like his father, he refused to have the leg amputated. And that son died of gangrene. So, um, but thank you, those were great questions. Well, on that happy note. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but let's end with that nice stained glass <laughs> window. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I know we weren't able to get to all of the questions that you submitted, but, um, Regan has put her email in the chat. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions or as you're mulling on things, you have anything you want to um, uh, post to Joyce, um, I think she can work on connecting you. Joyce has been uh, willing enough. To yeah, I'd be that. happy to reply to any emails that get sent questions. But thank you again for inviting me. Thank you so much, Joyce. And thank you, Amaris, for all of your help with tech support and putting all of this together with me. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees as well. We're so grateful that you were able to join us this afternoon. And um, stay tuned for our next lecture in February. It'll be on the fourth Thursday of the month. That's kind of where we're going with our series every uh, month from now until April, the fourth Thursday of the month at three o'clock will be our lecture series. So for more information, please visit our website at norwichespurplesociety.org. Thank you all. Great, thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank, thank you, you again, Joyce. Wonderful presentation. <laughs>